Yes. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. To our friends in the U.S., we've got some uh, echo in there. Take care of that feedback. Okay. So, friends in the U.S., and uh, good afternoon to our friends in Europe. Good evening to our friends in China, uh, late night Australia. Welcome to this special topical webinar on green cities and energy systems integration. I'm Charlie Smith, the executive director of ESIG and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As some of you may know, we were planning to do our annual International Energy Systems Integration Workshop in October in Suzhou, China this year, but due to the coronavirus situation, we pushed out the Suzhou workshop to the fall of 2021, and we decided to proceed with a webinar to give you a taste of things to come. The webinar was jointly planned by Mark O'Malley and myself, along with Professor Chong Ching Kang of Tsinghua University in China. We have a very exciting lineup of three outstanding individuals from Europe, China, and the US. And in that sense, the speakers are very reflective of what we had planned for the workshop in Suzhou. Regarding logistics, we'll have three individual presentations of 15 minutes each, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted, so we ask you to use the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So today, the topic is Green Cities and Energy Systems Integration, one of our special topic webinars, chaired by Mark O'Malley. Mark is a professor at UC Dublin, returning from a recent sabbatical at NREL, where he was the chief scientist for energy systems integration. During his previous time at UC Dublin, he led the world-renowned Electricity Research Center. Mark has too many accolades to mention, although I think that one of which he is very proud is his membership in the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. His current research interests lie broadly in the field of energy systems integration, as exhibited by his current leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Initiative. I've known Mark for many years, initially through our collaboration with IEA Wind. Task 25 on wind integration, and subsequently through participation in ESIG activities, where he now chairs the Research and Education Working Group. Mark is a good friend and a good friend of ESIG. Mark, we appreciate having you here, and I'll now turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Uh, so, welcome everybody to this uh, one hour session. Uh, the three speakers are like uh, Charlie said, one is from Europe, one is from the U.S., and one is from China, which I think is very appropriate considering the international flavor of what we're trying to achieve here. So our first speaker is Brian Motherway. I've known Brian for many years because he, he headed up Sustainable Energy Ireland in, in Ireland for many years before he went on to be the head of the Energy Efficiency Division of the IEA. So, Brian, are you ready? Yes, I am, Mark. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to Charlie. It's a great pleasure to be participating in this in this webinar. So hello to everybody on board. I'm the European representative. It's a sunny evening in Paris, France this evening that I'm joining you from. So I hope you're all well in the respective countries you're joining us from. I'm going to give a very broad overview of some of the issues before the subsequent speakers go into more detail about specific cases. Uh, and I'm going to start with some of the updates in terms of the, the global situation regarding energy in the unusual times we find ourselves in. First of all, of course, we know that we're living in lockdown. And in energy terms, more than half of the total global energy use across all sectors is in some form of lockdown. And of course, we're seeing that in current demand trends um, in, in all sectors and across all fuels. In particular, if we look at where we think 2020 will take us, all fuels are down. The only fuel that we see that is going to hold up in 2020 is renewables. There's two main reasons for that. This is particularly renewables and electricity. A, because a lot of new capacity was built last year and late last year, which is now online and available, and of course, cheap to run. And secondly, of course, a lot of renewable electricity has priority in dispatch and is so is holding its own in terms of current situations. So, holding its own, but still under pressure, as I'll mention again in a minute. Um, all of this lowering demand is leading to a very significant fall in CO2 emissions associated with energy, possibly the biggest we've ever seen in 2020. 
this is not something to celebrate. This is happening for all the wrong reasons because people's lives are affected. People are losing their lives. People are losing their jobs. These are not the reasons we want to see CO2 emissions going down. And of course, it's no guarantee that they won't rebound as soon as this crisis is over, which is exactly what we saw just over 10 years ago after the last financial crisis, when CO2 emissions, having initially fallen, grew back to be stronger growth than ever. So policy action is required if that is not going to happen this time. I mentioned renewables, and just a few days ago, we launched our new forecast for 2020, and just taking an example of renewable energy growth. I stress that these are growth figures. So we expect renewable energy to continue to grow um, across wind and PV and hydro in 2020 and 2021, but we expect it to grow at a slower rate than in 2019, as you can see here in the blue charts. And then we expect a degree of recovery in 2021, but not nearly as much as the past would have been previously. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty around these figures, but it gives us a sense of where we see the markets going in the next year or two. On the efficiency side, we had already seen before this crisis that global progress in efficiency has been slowing down. Each, each year, the world is becoming more energy efficient. We're extracting more value from the energy we use. But from a peak in 2015, we're actually progressing at less than half the, the global rate that we could be improving at. So there's a lot of scope through stronger policy action for faster progress on energy efficiency. And that's even before the extra pressures we see piling on now in the last few months. At the IEA, we have been working with governments and calling on the world to put a strong focus on clean energy as they start to think about the next phase of the COVID crisis, which is economic recovery. There are tremendous synergies between the short-term needs of economic stimulus and job creation and the longer, larger goals around energy security, resilience of energy systems, and of course, clean energy transition. And we've been working with governments directly to help them understand what the opportunities are and what the right policy choices for them may be in order to fully align these goals. At the heart of this is integration, particularly integration between energy efficiency and renewable energy. And what's making that more possible and more exciting than ever before are the advances in digitalization and the technologies algorithms, software, and all of the innovation that goes with that. We're seeing much more capability for advanced analytics, advanced control and sensing that is enabling the kind of integration and integrated thinking at a city level, at a grid level, between demand and supply, between efficiency and renewables, things that we've all theorized about for many years and many decades are now becoming possible and cheap and ready to deploy. We've been looking at this in some specific cases that I'll just mention in passing. Last year, we did some modeling of the cooling system in China, which continues to grow very strongly and is probably the largest, uh, the largest source of electricity demand growth in the Chinese electricity system. Um, and of course, the opportunity is not just for uh, deploying more efficient devices, for more efficient ACs to be sold, but also that to be coupled with an integrated approach to demand side response demand and su supply optimization and storage means that the overall investment costs, energy impacts, climate impacts could be drastically no lower if a more integrated and holistic policy approach is taken. We've seen live examples of this, and I'll just cite one of many, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this case in the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program, where integrated thinking between supply and demand allowed for a much more nuanced and ultimately cheaper approach to grid management, to asset management, and to grid balancing. So that supply and demand both played a part in optimization and therefore re reduction of investment costs and re reduction of overall system costs. And there are many examples around the world of that kind of innovative thinking. And again, I stress, we've been theorizing about this for many years and experimenting in various ways, but it's really the power of digitalization that is making this happen in a much more live and sophisticated way. Why cities then, the focus of today? Well, first of all, more and more people are living in cities. They're responsible for more and more energy demand and associated emissions and associated issues. But also in governance terms, a huge amount of the power to enact policies that can enable green, clean transitions, that can enable decarbonization, happen at a city level or happen at a city 
and national level shared. So we certainly see that the implementation power of cities needs to be recognized and needs to be leveraged in terms of the opportunities for faster, not just policy making, but policy implementation. Smart grids, of course, are at the center of this, and therefore investment in smart grids is at the center of this. This chart goes up to 2018, but just yesterday, we published new analysis to show that in 2019, there was a slight decline on investment in grids overall compared to 2018. And in 2020, we expect at least a 10% drop off in total grid investment, which of course is worrying for many reasons. It's understandable for many reasons, but it raises many questions in terms of deployment of smart technologies, modernization of grids, and enabling the infrastructure that will allow the kind of integration and new policy approaches that we are talking about today. So there's a real concern there that the investment we need in the underpinning technologies is under a lot of pressure at the moment. Policy is key here because the story of clean energy transitions and probably energy efficiency in particular is the difference between the theory of the opportunity and the practice of what happens on the ground. And, and when we see energy efficiency progressing in various parts of the world, we see it doing so because strong policies are put in place. And for digitalization, that applies double because policy needs to be ready for the innovation that's coming with digitalization in terms of policy design, regulatory design, and market design. And of course, the challenge for governments is it's not just about energy policy, it's not just about technology policy. There are many issues around data security, cybersecurity, data, data privacy, and ownership. So it's a whole of government response that's needed to put the kind of readiness framework in place that digital energy efficiency and digital clean technologies and clean transitions need to underpin them. I want to say to you that the IEA is very focused on these questions. We're working directly with a lot of governments just to say to you a few pieces of analysis that are underway. Just today, in fact, we published a new paper on our website, which you can find at IEA.org, on some of the transport behavior changes we've seen in the last few weeks and some of the policy implications of those in terms of what will make new, more sustainable transport patterns pit, stick and what kind of policies can underpin that. We're about to publish some new work on the role of utilities and utility programs in energy efficiency and stimulus, and we'll soon be publishing uh, some work on the role of cities, which today's discussion will inform. I also want to let you know that we've embarked on a new four-year project on smart and digital power infrastructure with a view to clean energy outcomes, in particular energy efficiency. This is a multi-year, multi-agency project uh, funded in primarily by the government of Italy, to whom we're very grateful. And we'd love to continue the conversation with many of you here to look at best practice around investment in smart technology at a grid level, particularly at the distribution side, can enable new policies and new approaches to clean energy and energy efficiency in particular. And finally, just by way of advertisement, Please watch this space from the IEA's perspective. In a couple of weeks' time, we'll publish a very special report on sustainable recovery, where we'll be highlighting some of the opportunities to governments in terms of where emissions can be reduced, uh, clean, clean transitions can be enhanced, but also jobs can be created. And we'll be advising governments on where their best opportunities lie for investing in clean energy that will marry stimulus goals with longer-term clean energy goals. And then in mid-June, we will be launching the recommendations of our Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency, which will go into a lot of the issues I'm raising in much more detail. And I'd invite you all to join us online on June 23rd for our IEA Global Conference on Energy Efficiency, where we'll be exploring all of these issues in more detail. And if you haven't received information about that conference yet, do feel free to follow up with me at any time, and I'd love to discuss with you further. So I'm going to close there, hand back to Mark, and I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Brian. I think one thing we forgot to tell everybody that the questions, there's a Q&A box on uh, where the question should go. So unfortunately, we did not alert people to that. So the questions, if they see the Q&A box, it should be down at the bottom right. If you please put your questions in there, and myself and Charlie will filter them. As a consequence, there, there is actually no questions in there, so I was wondering what was going on. So what we'll do is, if people have questions for Brian, they can put them in as we go. But I do have two, two questions for Brian uh, to kick it off anyway. You, you mentioned, Brian, that investment in infrastructure has um, 
uh, in 2019. Now that's pre-COVID. Is there is there any so that's not a COVID-related issue? So is there any reason for this, or do you do we understand why? I would have thought it was going to go up. Mark, it's been mostly stagnant for the last few years. Up till 2018, it was growing, but not by huge amounts. In 2019, there seemed to be a bit of a dip. You can see big actors like China and others making a big difference. So we don't know of any particularly strong reason. The, the, dip, the dip was relatively small. I think it's more of a sign of a lack of forward momentum rather than any particular you know, downfall in, in 2019. We're talking about plus or minus 2%. So we're hovering around zero, which is the deeper problem. And of course, as I said, we're expecting a, a bit of a fall off the cliff in 2020, which is a much greater concern. On the basis that more renewables will require enormous amounts of infrastructure to be built, is that correct? Well, in general, obviously, there's a lot of reasons for grid modernization. Of course, renewables drive that very much, and variable renewables. And one of the concerns we have is that when we look at the issues where government can, can if a government wants to invest now in something that will create jobs tomorrow and build, you know, a sustainable system for the future, sometimes grids find have faced some challenges around how quick it can get to market. And so we're looking at situations where plans are already in place, investment strategies are already in place. If governments don't have those, they will face challenges in terms of how quickly they can mobilize capital for great investment. But certainly the, the growth in renewables, as you know better than me, is very closely tied to the growth in the enabling infrastructure in the grid. And, and yes, that's exactly why we are concerned. Okay, so people have now found the Q&A box, which is good. Thank you for that. So there's a question here. Do you have recommended examples of legislation for customer energy data sharing and privacy? So this is the whole privacy issue, which is at the center of this digitalization, data privacy. Any recommendations? Tough area. Yeah, I'm just give me an hour to answer that question. But, um, but what I would say is I refer to you to some analysis we, we are doing, first of all, we have a report that came out last year on digitalization and energy that touches on this issue, but actually in a few weeks' time, we're going to be releasing a new report on electricity security that looks at some of these issues around data security and other dimensions. So it's a tough, answer, it's a tough question to answer in, in generality because it really depends on governance preferences and many other issues. So I, I can't cite a favorite policy here and now that would apply to everyone, but please refer to our web website for some of our more detailed work on that topic. Okay, there's a really good question here I, um, in terms of the team of everything we're trying to achieve here today. So I think it's very important to answer it. But this is about efficiency and integration. So what are the key factors impacting energy efficiency in different systems and how can integration contribute to efficiency improvement? So we're trying to marry the whole issue of integration of renewables and efficiency. What's the, what are the key factors I think, I think historically what was happening was we, we talked about two different things on the demand side in quite separate ways. One was what was often referred to as energy efficiency as a long-term thing. So how much energy does my house or my motor or my car use over the course of the year? And then in a separate room, we talked about, let's say, demand side response or demand side management, which is about system balancing over the course of seconds or minutes or days. But digitalization blurred those boundaries and it allows us to think not about end use efficiency, but system efficiency. Because there are times when an efficient washing machine adds no value because there's plenty of clean, cheap power available. There's a, there's a time a few hours later in the same day where those appliances being more efficient has tremendous economic and environmental value. And therefore, time and location of efficiency and demand becomes as, as important to think about as time and location of supply. And therefore, what's happening now, which I think is a really important and really opportune evolution, is we're moving from just thinking about efficiency purely as how much energy something uses as an end use over time into this much more dynamic, integrated thinking between supply and demand, system balancing, grid optimization. And I think that will be really where the future opportunities are. Okay. In other words, dynamic efficiency to match exactly. the system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, there's some more questions, but I think we need to move on because we're, we, we're at 19 minutes past the hour. Okay, thank you, Brian. There might be some questions at the end as well. Okay, our next speaker is Lauren Faber O'Connor. Um, I, I also know Lauren. I've never actually met her. I spoke to her on the phone a few times. 
So Lauren Faber O'Connor is the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Los Angeles, driving the implementation of Mayor Garcia's newly released LA's Green New Deal, a global model for local action to the climate crisis. And the Green New Deal is a big topic, particularly in Europe. Europe is clearly going after a, 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 a European Green New Deal. Los Angeles are obviously doing their own version of it. Lauren, over to you. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, I really appreciate being part of the, <laughs> the seminar today. And um, even more so, just appreciate the, the focus of the role of cities in you know, energy systems and, and energy systems integration, because I have come to believe in my career um, how central and core the role of cities are uh, playing in achieving our climate goals and really dealing with uh, the climate crisis through energy innovation. Uh, not something I was necessarily convinced of earlier on in my, in my career. I'm from Los Angeles and grew up here. I never thought I would work here. Um, and so you know, it definitely was not um, preordained that I, you know, wanted to uh, be working in Los Angeles on climate change and clean energy. But as I said, just over over time, it became clear that here's an opportunity to have a real impact. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Next slide. Um, this picture is a picture of the mayor, Mayor Garcetti, here in Los Angeles. Um, this is him in Copenhagen this past fall in October of last year. And uh, this was at the C40 Cities Summit, which is a climate cities leadership group that the mayor had just become at this summit the chair of. And that's 96 megacities from around the world who are all working together at the mayoral level, not at the staff level, not at the kind of bureaucratic level, but at the mayoral level working together on climate change. And he was just um, voted in as chair of that group. And one of the things he said, um, and in some ways, I feel like you could insert any issue here, and it would probably be the case, but nobody is doing more than cities when it comes to tackling the climate emergency, but nobody is doing enough. Um, and, you know, cities are certainly the, the first and last line of defense when it comes to um, helping our citizens cope with climate disasters, um, which we see on a regular basis here in Los Angeles, whether that's through fire or drought or extreme heat waves um, year over year. But also now, as we're in the middle of this uh, current pandemic crisis, you know, we've been speaking with, you know, health officials and cities are also super spreaders. Um, so cities are super spreaders of, of the good, the bad and the ugly. And so you got to work with cities. Um, and so it's an extraordinarily powerful, but also, um, unique and delicate role to be in as a city and in, in understanding the official authorities that you have um, and also how to work with other uh, branches of government, other partners in the private sector and the public sector in the academic um, uh, institutions and in our, with our nonprofit community partners to really get things done. Um, but that's how cities have to work. And, and frankly, I think that's why we are you know, developing good recipes for success is because we have to work across all of those lines. And our, our work with um, the Department of Energy is, is a great example of that, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So Mark mentioned LA's Green New Deal. Um, on the face of it, and this is, you know, this is a slide from a year ago now. This is a year old slide maybe a little bit more so. Um, but on the face of it, LA's Green New Deal was, the, was really inserting the mayor's vision for how LA needs to address the climate emergency, which also is a catastrophic social and equity um, and economic emergency uh, for the city and for, for the world when it comes to you know, the impact of climate change and how it's gonna impact our economic and social systems. Um, and so we had to take that head on, and uh, that's what um, LA's Green New Deal became. It also was really um, our demonstration to the world of how we are going to uphold the Paris Climate Agreement, which is something that the mayor committed to doing, you know, years before, um, and 
and we needed to demonstrate quantitatively, and I'll get into what that looks like, how we were actually going to do that from an emissions reduction basis across the, the Los Angeles economy. Next slide. Um, but embedded in that, embedded in, you know, what does that look like quantitatively, is not just that commitment to Paris from a GHG reduction standpoint, but that we have to deliver those emission reductions and deliver those climate programs in a way that benefits our most vulnerable communities and really lifts them up as part of the solutions development as well, um, that it's really community-driven processes, um, as well as ensures that everyone has a chance to participate in the green economy, that the green economy is an economy for all, um, and that is an extraordinarily important piece of this puzzle because people really have to see themselves in these solutions. And if they can't, then it's very, very hard to move these through. So when you talk about, when um, Brian is talking about the importance of the policy landscape, I immediately go to well, the importance of the people impacted by those policies in order for us to be able to put those policies in place. Um, and then, of course, what we do with our own powers as a municipal government. And Los Angeles is in a particularly... Um, advantageous spot when it comes to our local powers because we uniquely own and operate our own municipal utility, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which is the largest municipal utility in the country. But we also own and operate the Port of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles World Airport. So those are extraordinary, extraordinarily large um, pieces of economic infrastructure and energy infrastructure together that are controlled by the city, um, that we are not kind of takers of what those industries, those utilities um, want to do in our city, but we actually um, hold the pen on what they ought to be doing and how they ought to be operating. But it's a true test for us because um, that is, those are economic engines for the city. Um, and so we have to be able to continue to enable um, our, our airports, our ports, uh, you know, to thrive, um, which is a very separate, fascinating conversation to be having in the kind of current pandemic stage that we're in. But we have to be able to show how we do that cleanly. And so our efforts around our electricity grid, around our um, airport and our port are particularly paramount and I think important for LA to succeed on. So the grid, the grid work is um, a really exciting one that I'm, I spend a lot of my time on. Next slide. Overall, um, our Green New Deal, just so you have a sense, it covers the, the waterfront. I mean, it really does, because in order to reach those types of, those types of uh, you know, goals and ambition that we have for greenhouse gas reductions, but really for prosperity and, and health, we have to be able to address all of these issues together. And that's a little bit even of that integration that, um, you know, Brian was, was referring to before. But it's not just sort of the bread and butter environmental work that you might think of on clean energy or on water conservation, clean water, on, um, you know, uh, zero emission vehicles, but very much with our food systems, our waste systems, our urban ecosystem, um, housing, integrating our, our housing work directly into you know, what kind of materials we use, um, what that transit-oriented development needs to look like, all of those things kind of work together. And so it's a, it's a very broad um, report that gets into significant detail with goals and targets around each of these uh, topic areas. Next slide. But fundamentally, when it comes to our greenhouse gas reductions, we really boil those down to the five zeros which is a zero carbon grid, zero carbon buildings, zero carbon transportation, zero waste, and zero wasted water. And so you all can probably see yourselves in one, if not many of these icons here, um, that for a zero carbon grid, now, as I said, LA owns and operates its own municipal utility. That, municip that municipal utility is still vertically integrated. So we actually, do own and operate our elect much of our um, electricity generation portfolio, um, as well as run our own uh, uh, distribution grid, transmission and distribution grid. And that's very unique for, for California. Um, we are basically all of California and Los Angeles when it comes to 
the, the California grid, which is a, an extraordinarily unique position to be in. It's a powerful position to be in, but it's also significant responsibility um, to, to keep up with innovation and to push innovation, given where we know we want to be and need to be. Um, and so our work on a zero carbon grid is some of the most exciting pieces of work because that is the foundation for everything else. Um, it means that we can plug in our buildings. It means that we can plug in our, our uh, cars and buses and trucks. If we want to plug those things in, we have to plug them into a zero carbon grid. So it really is foundational to everything else um, in meeting our goals in LA's Green New Deal, as well as significant landfill uh, waste diversion and moving toward a circular economy, exciting things around um, around recycling infrastructure and uh, biogenic material and composting. And if there are folks who are interested in water, I'd be happy to, to go into a, a lot of exciting work that we're doing on uh, water resource recovery as well. Next slide. So since I think there's a lot of numbers people um, on the line, this is, the, this is gonna be the most number heavy slide you're gonna get. Um, but just to show that our work in LA's Green New Deal is, is grounded in quantitative analysis of um, a carbon budget. So we've developed a carbon budget for the city of Los Angeles cut across these sectors. Um, and so you can see in the, the, wedges slot, the wedges graph here that we have the building energy use, industry, transportation, and waste um, as our main GHG sectors understanding that the energy, um, the electricity consumption is sort of embedded in those sectors. So the zero carbon grid is captured there. Um, and you can see that what we're looking to do is, and this matters from sort of that, that policy perspective that Brian was talking about, we're looking for significant near-term acceleration of reduction. So that line is very steep in the early years. Um, it, it of course continues to just barrel downward, but you can see that it softens out slightly in the out years past, you know, past 2025, 2030, but really needing those early reductions now um, in order to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement in order to do what's right for the climate, which is get those emissions, keep those emissions out of the atmosphere now. Um, next slide. So one piece of this, and honestly, this slide could have been the LA 100 study, this could have been our work to get a zero emission port and have 100% zero emission drayage trucks at the port by 2035. This slide could have been our work to accelerate our bus electrification to 2028 by the time we welcome the Olympics. Um, this slide could have been a num our, our work on buildings, um, which I can come on to as well, but we're really excited and proud of, and it's a particular particular um, passion of mine, our LA100 study, which is our partnership with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, which is how I got um, linked up with Mark to begin with. But it's now a few years ago that I um, was engaging with all of the national labs in a former role that I had at DOE. And um, all the labs, uh, and if there's labs represented on the line, thank you for all of your work that you do every day across all of the, the sectors and fields that the lab, the DOE labs cover and our national lab um, you know, environment covers. But uh, the NREL work is particularly exciting for us because it really is, you know, from NREL's perspective, the, the first of its kind, the, the most comprehensive integrated analysis of how to reach 100% renewable energy uh, delivery into the city, into a city, and it's particularly um, complicated because, as I mentioned, the nature of LADWP, the nature of our grid in particular, um, it is, it's a complicated one. We have to include, um, you know, there's the, the energy systems uh, flow dynamics. There's not just um, the work that we want to do to understand the economics or the you know, specific types of um, technologies to pursue. Yes, we want those answers, but going into that, of course, includes, are we meeting resource adequacy? You know, what's the distribution analysis? What's the 
um, you know, the production cost modeling, what I've learned so much from the team on all of these things, but as well as what's the economic and job impact, what's the localized air impact, all of these things are being considered in this analysis together. So it's a significantly um, broader analysis around our entire economic transition based in transitioning our renewable or our energy grid um, to 100% renewable energy. So this is um, a two and a half year study. It will be completed by the end of the year. It, it is not recommending, next slide, um, it's not recommending a specific policy or approach, but it's laying out it's laying out the options, it's laying out the roadmap, um, and it's going to basically be able to give us the, the tools we need to have to make those policy decisions um, that we're really excited to, to move on to that particular chapter. But an important piece to note about this process was not just the extraordinary partnership between LADWP, the city, and NREL, but also um, NREL's work and DWP's work with other partners, other local um, academic partners in, in LA to do a lot of sub you know, parts of the modeling um, and specific aspects of analysis, but also that we ran a, and are, are currently running a, um, a stakeholder advisory group. And that stakeholder advisory group is made up of a very, very, uh, diverse range of sort of stakeholders that are um, impacted by this analysis, whether they are um, ratepayers themselves, whether they are large customers, whether they are environmental and health advocates, whether they are um, energy producers in the city. Um, there's a, a it's been an incredible group of people that have been meeting on a regular basis for two and a half years to iterate with us on you know, what kind of assumptions should we be making, what kind of scenarios do we need to be considering. And NREL has been um, incredible at taking in that feedback and then you know, um, uh, feeding it into their modeling and presenting it back out to the advisory group. So that will continue. I want to just end with a last slide, which is just kind of holding back onto the moment that we're in right now. And so I said, you know, at the top that those slides I was showing you were kind of our year old stock slides of LA's Green New Deal because um, had we not been in the pandemic emergency that we were in right now, we would have last year celebrated the one year anniversary of LA's Green New Deal and all the things that we've been able to accomplish in that one year. Um, but what, you know, what we really have now in LA's Green New Deal is a blueprint for a green recovery. And, you know, the mayor is extraordinarily committed to building back better. Um, it is devastating what is going on in the city of Los Angeles um, from a health perspective and an economic perspective. And I know that that's true probably everywhere that folks are in that are tuning into this webinar. And so my heart goes out to you and I hope everyone's families um, are safe and healthy and well. Uh, but we know that returning to normal, our goal of just like, want to get back to normal, is not a goal that the mayor shares because normal is sort of what got us into this crisis. It got us into this climate crisis and it got us into this um, health crisis. And so we have to build back in a way that builds, our, builds ourselves more resilient to those kinds of crisis, crises. We have to build back better. We have to build back in a way that, that um, addresses all the inequities that have been exposed by this pandemic um, and that building back to normal will, will only um, show that we more knowingly have, have uh, enabled these inequities and we have to use our policy levers and our innovation opportunities to right those wrongs um, and that that's what the opportunity is before us. Of course, in the moment we are we are completely focused on getting people tested, making sure there's, you know, um, hospital capacity, but we also are focused on how are we getting people back to work as safe as possible, and what are the jobs that people ought to be going back into, um, what jobs aren't coming back, and then going back through our Green New Deal and saying, these are the jobs we wanted to build anyway. The disruption is coming from a place that maybe we hadn't anticipated, um, and so... Now we, now we know better and we have to build back better. And with that, my daughter says it's time for me to yield back my time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, there's lots of questions here. So tomorrow, like the comprehension, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's my favorite, my favorite movie and my favorite saying of all. So thanks for that. So just a couple of sort of inter interacting questions here. Um, I mean, LA has a single, you know, has a municipality. It controls everything essentially. How, you know, that is clearly an advantage in what you're trying to do. How would you recommend it for people who don't have that advantage of a single municipality that controls everything? Was that the question? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, which is the vast majority, right? Um, if you don't have a municipal utility, then, you know, there's, there's, uh, I see a lot of cities do things through, for example, their own municipal um, buying power. And so, you know, they say, okay, for municipal um, um, operations, we're going to go 100% renewable energy. Now, of course, some of that, um, you know, we're seeing cities and we've been helping even cities go and do joint RFPs and joint procurements to build projects, renewable energy projects that directly serve them. Um, but where they, you know, where they can't do that, they have to do a couple things. One, use the power of, of advocacy for state level change at their, at their state level PUCs. But also um, what most cities do have are, for example, building codes. Um, building codes in terms of energy efficiency. So if you start to like bring all of the other pieces together and then the integration and that innovation kind of come, the, the industries start to come together. And I think that that can build an improved ecosystem for the, um, the political attractiveness of, if you, if you find yourself somewhere that, you know, is truly pushing back on, on clean energy, um, that innovation kind of comes together. So as you push efficiency, as you push electric vehicles, um, the, the clean energy pieces kind of come together and I think you can build those industries and industries of power within your, your cities, in your regions that can help push those policies forward then. Okay, there's another good question here and I'm gonna add, a, I'm gonna add two of them together really. Uh, if, if you try and go to 100% yeah, clean energy, uh, back to what uh, we spoke with uh, Brian earlier, it's gonna need more infrastructure but if you then try and put transport on it as well, you're going mm -hmm. to have to build an awful lot of infrastructure. How, like, how are you going to do that? And you can see what Brian just said. Brian just said that um, it's a global number that infrastructure build and the grid is, is reducing, not increasing. So how do you know that? Yeah, I mean, it's very true that, um, and and I will, you know, I will say that it can be used um, by detractors against us that you know we're going. Too, too much too fast, that plugging everything in is, you know, the, the energy grid can't handle that. Um, and, you know, for one, we, we understand the vulnerability and we understand that we have to move very carefully. Um, we also, I think, fundamentally believe that there are a ton of efficiencies um, in both the upstream and end use technologies that are not being accounted for when, when, when people assert that there's no way the grid can handle plugging in buildings and, and uh, the transportation sector as well. <clears throat> but that's why we really do look to our industry partners. That's why we really do look to the LA 100 study. That's why we look to ensure that as we make these moves, that we, as we put in policy, we're not just building a bunch of, you know, dumb chargers across the city overnight, but that we're making sure we're making the smartest possible decisions. Ele decarbonizing our buildings, electrifying our buildings, that is going to take us a while. We have to do it. We absolutely have to do it. It is the number one um, uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Los Angeles. It's also a huge equity issue, an indoor air quality issue, but it is going to have to take some time and planning. And so that's what DWP loves to do is, is plan, but we've made sure that we do it in a way that is informed by our goals and, in, and done in partnership with folks like NREL to kind of help chart our course. So I would say that we don't have an immediate answer as to um, 
you know, exactly how much we have to build right now. But we totally understand that there can be a situation of some overbuild in some cases and areas where we really do have to focus on infrastructure improvements because of bottlenecks. If we're looking at charging depots, you know, for our buses, that's a, a huge area where we know that it's not the bus technology itself that may be kind of keeping us at a certain pace to get to our end goals, but rather the distribution infrastructure to support the charging. Okay. Uh, a lot of questions in the chat box. If you want to look at uh, the questions, but we do need to move on. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker then is um, Dr. Chi Young Ming, Engineer of Renewable Energy uh, Research Center in China, and serves as the Secretary of IEC Task 8 SC 8A, Grid Integration of Renewable Energy. Uh, and he's also an expert member of the IEA DPAR Group. I know Young Ming pretty well from my time in China. You can see the way we've planned this. It sort of goes from the generic down to something very specific. Yang Ning, over to you. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Yung Ning from uh, China Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, I'm the chief engineer of Renewable Energy uh, Research Center and also work for IEC and the secretary of uh, SEDA. Uh, since uh, 2014. Uh, thanks, Charlie, for inviting me today, sharing our experiences on the topic of uh, LVDC, L MVDC grid, uh, which now are gradually used for uh, incorporating uh, distributed PV and supplying DC load uh, in many cities. So, uh, first, I would like to uh, lead you back 100 years ago, uh, where uh, there was a war of the current between uh, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. You probably know the story. Uh, then today, the revi revival of DC. This is not uh, the comic DC. It's a direct current. Uh, so uh, starting uh, in the late uh, 1880s, uh, Thomas Edison and uh, Nikola Tesla were involved in the battle now known as the uh, War of the Currents. Uh, Edison developed a DC uh, direct current uh, that uh, running uh, continuously in a single direction uh, during the early year of uh, electricity. DC was the standard in the US. Uh, but there was one problem. Uh, direct current is not easily uh, converted to uh, higher or lower voltages. Uh, but Tesla believed that uh, alternating current in AC was a solution to this problem uh, and can be converted to different voltage level by using a transformer. Uh, in 1893, the Niagara Four Power Company decided to award uh, Westinghouse, the contract to uh, generate power. Uh, on, this, on November 16, 1896, uh, Tesla was lit up by the AC electricity from Niagara Falls. Uh, by this time, uh, GE decided to turn to the AC solution. So uh, since then, the uh, dominance uh, AC took the dominance in power system, uh, including uh, city distribution network. Uh, so what is happening in uh, present day city? Also today, our electricity is still mainly powered by AC, but we can see a lot of load are powered by DC, uh, such as computers, uh, LED lights, uh, solar PV cells, uh, and more and more electric vehicles uh, running on DC power. And also the invention uh, of the DC DC converter make it possible uh, for converting DC to higher and lower voltages. So over the last decades, we witnessed more implementations of LVDC technology in use. 
Uh, the main drivers, uh, including uh, several, uh, the first one is the very quick uh, development of a distributed PV with DC output. Uh, the second main driver is the uh, large amount of use of DC loads. For example, electric vehicle and the modern uh, data center, uh, people start to think uh, how about to use a DC network directly link the DC source with DC load. And the third driver will be the trend for improving energy efficiency and uh, electricity access, especially for the developing economy. Uh, now we notice that uh, the city distribution network, especially in developing countries like China, uh, attempts to be uh, developed into a new stage uh, with hybrid AC, DC, or pure LV. I know the speaker is concerned about his uh, his connection from his office in China. So he had a plan for a backup telephone, and hopefully, uh, yeah, I see, I'll see him again. Hopefully, he's back on. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me, Charlie? Yes, I, I can hear you, but Young Ning, we can't hear you yet. Yeah. Yeah. Young Ning, can you hear? We can't hear you. Yang Ning. Ryan, can no? you? Yeah, is that you? Okay, you're back. Yeah, hi, Charlie. Uh, okay. All right, please please continue. You're, you're back. We lost you, but you're back again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I start from this slide. Uh, so, uh, you can see today uh, many utilities are beginning to uh, connect uh, renewable energy resources and consumer via LVDC. Uh, and also we can see many uh, advantages of DC. Uh, compared to AC, uh, DC distribution requires uh, fewer lines, cables, transmit the same amount of energy, and uh, maybe get higher energy uh, conversion efficiency and also good power quality because of a fewer conversion stage in DC to DC. Uh, currently, the share of DC application is still very low. And there is one possibility that the DC still take a very small proportion due to the high uh, initial investment and small scale industrialization. But there's still uh, another possibility uh, looks optimistic, driven by the uh, development of DC integration of PV and widely use of DC load, such as the uh, EV, uh, LED light, and uh, household DC uh, appliance. Uh, it will overcome the market inertia and uh, the total cost will be reduced. Uh, this could be possible to happen in new built city area and also in some developing economy. Uh, so, uh, so far there are already existed several pilot projects uh, put into operation uh, all over the world. Here I can uh, show you a very quick look, uh, the practice of LVDC, MVDC uh, globally. Uh, okay, here we can see a few uh, demonstration projects for LVDC, MVDC application uh, located from uh, United States to uh, European country uh, and also Yang Ning Yang Ning He's disappeared again. 
Sorry? Yeah, he's, he's disappeared again. Must be a bad internet connection. I, I think he came back on on the internet. All right. I don't know if he's calling in now or if he's trying to log back on again. Ryan, what do you see? Young Ming, are you on? Yeah, I can hear uh, hear you all very clear, but uh, I don't know why. Okay, maybe just turn off your video. Yeah, turn off the video, Young Ming, because it takes up bandwidth. Turn okay, let's try. Uh, yeah, it looks better. We yeah, can hear you now, yes. Yeah, turn off the video. Okay, yeah. the connection is not stable. Uh, I think the video is off, so go ahead, Yang Ning. I think we're, we're okay, okay now. Okay. Uh, so here I show you some uh, demonstration projects from United States to European country and also to China. Uh, here you can see uh, the DC voltage is varied from uh, like uh, plus minus 110 watt to uh, plus minus uh, 375 watt also to, uh, to some medium voltage level, like uh, plus minus 10 kV. Uh, but it looks like uh, so far there didn't exist a standardized DC voltage level yet. Uh, the DC system uh, demonstrates the practice of PV integration and also DC load supplying. Uh, and may also with some uh, experimental functions in developing the relevant technology. Uh, so here is a project uh, named Smart Renewable Energy Town of Tongli uh, in Suzhou. Uh, Suzhou is a very famous Chinese uh, old city. And here you can see an AC-DC hybrid electrical system is, is designed uh, in which there is a LVDC network for connecting uh, rooftop PV, wind power, and uh, energy storage via DC-DC converter. Uh, another case uh, is a DC-powered data center in uh, Qiandaohu Lake, means Southern Island Lake in Hangzhou. Uh, this project is uh, constructed by Alibaba, the biggest Chinese internet company. It uh, uses 240 watt full DC for the power supply also with a DCL generator as a backup and the rooftop uh, PV integration. Uh, this project was put into operation since 217, uh, cooling by the lake water, and the overall system efficiency is larger than uh, 97%. Uh, there's another two uh, cases. One is in Shenzhen city. Uh, is the Shenzhen Research Institute of Architecture Design, uh, also with a, a name of US China Clean Energy Research Center. Uh, it's a pure uh, DC powered building uh, with a voltage level plus minus 375 watt, and uh, there is a 150 kV PV directly connect, connected into this DC building. And uh, so the last case uh, is the MVDC distribution system for university campus in Aachen University in, in Germany, including a four megawatt testing bench uh, for DC integration of wind turbine, and also a five megawatt high-speed test bench uh, for testing the high-speed drive chain. Uh, let's have a look on our activity. Uh, uh, SEPRI have a, has a testing uh, wind farm uh, in this area, it's uh, in uh, Zhangbei County, uh, which is uh, 250 kilometers away from Beijing up to north, uh, known as the National Wind Power Integration Center, uh, NVIC. So we start to build a experimental platform for MVDC, LVDC network with the capacity to testify the operation, control, and pr protection of the DC system with many PV feeding and with the uh, uh, DC load for uh, supply. 
uh, you can see uh, there's a DC transformer uh, to uh, convert the DC voltage from a low voltage to a medium voltage and also DC breaker for uh, clearing the DC fault. Uh, okay, uh, the next slide is uh, besides the development of the main DCTC facilities like a DCTC converter, DC breaker, uh, we still have a lot of uh, research topics on the management of the DC network. Activities are ongoing in parallel uh, in IEC and SIGRI. In IEC, there's a system committee uh, called LVDC dealing with the roadmap of uh, standardization work in the area of LVDC, try to meet the future need and the standardization of LVDC application. Also under uh, IEC SEAA, we spent several time in discussing the low, low LVDC MVDC for incorporating the digital PV source, and also plan to use a working group uh, dealing with the relevant uh, standard work. Uh, the concept of LVDC MVDC distribution uh, allows for the local generation and distribution of electricity to its local consumption uh, without uh, the need for transmit the transformation to AC. Uh, so we also can kind of DC network should be used as a uh, alternate energy integration system for electricity distribution. Standardization of LVDC and VDC will help facilitate applications of AC technology and uh, accelerate its uh, commercialization by providing a platform to manufacturers and enable huge power savings. So my slide also uh, receiving some contributions from uh, Professor uh, Zhu Miao from Shanghai Jiaozhou University. Uh, here I leave uh, the contact information of our two uh, if you have any question on the LVDC technology or IEC, uh, you can uh, reach me or Professor Zhu for further information. It is, uh, that is all my uh, presentation for today. Okay, thank you, Yang Ning, and we're, we apologize to everyone for the techno technological issues we had during that session. So there's some questions here, Yang Ning, very quickly. Uh, one of them, and I'll sort of roll it together with another one as well. Uh, you know, practical cable length for transmission lines at 10 kV. I mean, you know, DC, DC transmission lines at 10 kV, what's the practical cable length? Uh, yeah, normally, uh, the uh, practical cable length is for several kilometers, uh, such as in Tomli, uh, there's a pilot project. Uh, and I remember, uh, the area of this uh, Tomli uh, pilot project is like uh, uh, eight or ten uh, kilometers square, so the length could be could be several uh, kilometers long. Okay, and there's another very generic question here that I think is worth asking. You know, and I I don't know if this is a practical question, but it's an interesting question. What obstacles to shift from AC to DC? You know, I mean, I don't think we're ever going to do it because we have an AC grid. You know, if we were to transfer a lot of the AC to DC, what are the practical obstacles to this? Uh, sorry, I, I can't hear you. Uh, I can hear you. What, what are the current main obstacles to AC to DC? The, sort of the practical options from going from AC to DC. Mark, you're pretty broken up too. Let, let me repeat the question for Young Ning and you can hear me better. Young Ning, the, the question is yeah. what are the primary obstacles in shifting from an AC to a DC grid for low and medium voltage? Oh. 
Okay. Uh, maybe in the conventional uh, AC distribution power grid, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, change from AC to DC. Uh, one reason is uh, the, uh, the the cost for the retrofit would be very high. Another reason is uh, maybe the cost for DC uh, facilities because of its Hello. But uh, Hello. Uh, in the practice level, uh, when we compare uh, uh, LVDC and uh, LVAC system, maybe the LVDC uh, cost a little bit higher than LVD LVAC now. For example, 20% higher or 30% higher. So we can expect in maybe in the future if the DC uh, play a very important uh, a role and uh, the cost will be reduced, then it will be competing to the AC. But for the MVDC, it's, a, it's another story because right now the MVDC is a really uh, higher cost, I mean, really higher than the, than the AC because of the DC DC converter. If you try to develop a DC DC converter with uh, like a 10 time visual, Okay, Mark. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think we probably ought to go ahead and wrap it up. I think yeah. the yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, Charlie. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Look, guys, we're sorry about the technological issues. I'd like to thank our three speakers, Brian, Lauren, and Yang Ning. I think it was very successful. Um, I think it's interesting that um, Yan Ning mentioned Suzhou. That is where we plan to have the next DCIG International Conference, hopefully in 2021. So keep your eyes open for that. If you have any feedback on this, because this was really a trial run to see, you know, this is a topic we haven't we haven't really dealt with before in, in ESIC. If you have any feedback, send me or Charlie or info at ESIC.energy an email. Um, just to let you all know that the uh, ESIC Forecasting and Markets Workshop, which is supposed to be held in Denver um, next week, will be now held online. It's going to be in nine different sessions over the coming weeks. And the first one of those is next Tuesday at 2, two o'clock Eastern time. So I'm, I expect to see some of you there. I'm, I'm uh, performing in the first session myself. So thank you for your participation. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Charlie, anything?